May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. The medical science has reached a level, uh, Sadhguru. We really do not have to touch the patient. When I see a patient in my office, he would have undergone all kinds of tests. Everything is done, all the images are displayed, history is written, everything is planned. Technically, I can see the reports and tell the patient, okay, you need a bypass or you need valve replacement. But I always make it a point to take my stethoscope, put it on the chest, listen to the heart, look at the patient's eyes, put my hand around on his shoulders, touch the patient, and then explain to them what is going on and talk to the family. I personally feel that touch is the, has the most healing power than anything else what we have invented. Do you believe in that, uh, Swamiji? See, what is not understood is, yes, one part of us is mechanical, but there are other dimensions. Most of the time, the mechanical part has gone wrong because we have not tended to the other dimensions. So what is lacking in their life is, their life is not touched, not necessarily a physical touch, it's just a manifestation. Essentially, their life is not touched by anything. When I say touched by anything, it need not necessarily be a relationship. You can be touched by so many things. Uh, I don't know, how many of you… Uh, when was the last… Uh, how many decades ago did you watch a sunrise? Uh, or a sunset, or a moonrise. I'm saying not touched by anything. When was it the last time you waited for a flower to bloom? No such thing. When is the last time you paid an attention to a butterfly, or a leaf, or a flower, or another human being? You're… <laughs> of course. <laughs> you don't like faces, you like the Facebook <laughs> I'm saying contact with life whether it's human, animal, plant life or just elements around you, just that. How many people even take a moment to even look at the food that they're going to consume with a little bit of involvement or are they touched by it? No. So at last either a doctor has to touch it or in the end underca undertaker will touch you <laughs> you know. <laughs> somebody will touch you, things gone bad, somebody has to touch you. So, does touch have a relevance? Tremendous relevance. Touch need not always be physical, it can be in so many different ways. If you are not touched by life, you are a dying life, you are not a living life. It may happen to you after some time, but it's happening, you're in progression. Because what you call as life, even in the physical level, it's a, it's a medical knowledge for everybody now. The number of cells you have is more than the number of stars in the Milky Way, okay? Every day, over six hundred million billion cells are dying and new cells are being born. That means every second, ten million cells are dying and ten million new cells are born in your body. If you just take… leave the old, old guys. If you just take charge of this new ten million cells every every second that's coming up in your body, if you structure them properly, create them properly, if you have some say in how they will happen, if you have some influence as to how these fresh cells are born, your heart should be fixed, your brain should be fixed, everything should be fixed because that is the level of opportunity you have to rejuvenate your life second to second. But because you're totally oblivious to life, when I say oblivious to life, I want you to look at this. Right now, you cannot even call yourself as a living being because most of the time, what is happening with you is just thought and emotion. Thought and emotion is just psychological drama. 
it has no existential relevance. Here, a thousand people can sit here and live in thousand different worlds right now. That means nobody is in reality. Nobody is living, everybody is thinking about life. Psychological space, what happens, has unfortunately overtaken the existential process of life. You do not experience life, you're only thinking and reacting to situations around you. Thought and emotion is dominating everything. So right now, today morning, sun came up on time. You don't think much about that, okay, so what? <laughs> no, you need to understand, if sun does not come up tomorrow morning, within eighteen hours, all life on this planet will largely cease, as we know it. So I'm telling you, sun came up on time today morning. I want to hear appropriate noises. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> None of the planets in this solar system collided today. In the whole universe, no accidents. In this endless cosmos, no accidents, everything going right. But you have one nasty little thought crawling in your head and it's a bad day. I'm saying you completely lost perspective with life. You lost perspective as to who you are. It's a kind of madness. So once you lose perspective as to who you are and what is your… what is your space and status in this existen existence, you are a sickness by nature. It's not the doctor has to diagnose you. It's already on. One day it will manifest to a point where his instruments or his touch will tell him, but it's already on. The process is on. When it goes beyond a point, he'll give you a prescription or a surgery. But the process is on, you're working hard towards it <laughs> There are large number of Indian or Western techniques of healing which may not have scientific data, but they work. And I have a personal experience Many years ago, my uh, wife developed lower backache. It was intense pain, excruciating pain. As usual, I took her to a neurologist, they did MRI and everything is fine, there is no problem, but poor thing, she was I'm really… I'm glad you were not a spinal surgeon, <laughs> otherwise you would have done it <laughs> Then my brother-in-law suggested that uh, I should take her to see a acupuncture specialist. As a doctor, you know, it was a bit embarrassing for me to go to somebody <laughs> and, <laughs> and he didn't have a fancy clinic, I went to his house and he talked to my wife for a few minutes and uh, he made her sleep flat on the floor and Sadhguru, he took, you know, from the, the, the heel he started pressing on a lower back for ten minutes as I was watching. I'm not exaggerating, she never had the lower back pain ever since. I'll show you thousands and thousands like that. <laughs> not with, not I, even with any needles, simply. I was so fascinated because he cured my wife and he did something which I couldn't do it for thirty-two years, she was fine. <laughs> There are many ways of yes. uh, treating uh, people and as professionals, we have to respect all the ways of uh, treating. Definitely, I would say allopathic system is at its best when there's an emergency. When there is time, definitely other systems are way better if you ask me in many ways. Particularly, this is something hardly known to people, in southernmost part of India, largely in Tamil Nadu, we have what is called a Siddha, Siddha Vaidya. It's a most incredible medical system, so comprehensive. There are over 300,000 formulations. I don't think even modern pharmacopoeia has that. Over 300,000 formulations elaborately written down. And the fundamental difference between Ayurveda and Siddha is, Ayurveda is herb-based, Siddha is elemental. 
The only thing is, the skill level that it demands from the doctor is a challenge in modern world. This is something that you have to live, then only it works. The person who administers it is as important as what is administered. Who administers it? You're talking about touch, so who administers it is important, not just what is administered. But the nature of modern medicine is, you write a prescription, some chemist who knows nothing about it gives it and they take it, it's only purely chemical and it works. But when there are chronic ailments, if there is infection, killing it with whatever, you know, chemical bombing it is the way to do it. But when you're generating an illness from within, correcting it from within is most important. If there's an emergency, you have to intervene more aggressively, that's different. But these systems have such a comprehensive knowledge about health and well-being. But the problem is, it needs a lifelong involvement and dedication to become something good with this kind of system. It is not something that you can acquire as a profession and do it. Always it was seen as a sacred duty that you can actually… See, I, I want uh, everybody to think about it, and I'm sure many times you're facing this within yourself. It's not… it is not a prescription, it is not a surgery, it is not something. It's a person's life, whether he lives or dies. I mean, your existence, <laughs> it's… it's not a… it is not a case, it is not a statistic. For that person, it is the only life that he has. <laughs> but otherwise, in every cell in the body, there is air. So when you say air, it's not just the breath. Six percent air is in every cell in the body. Just remove it a little bit from the brain, it'll be good. It's good if it's in the lungs, in the heart, in the muscles. They function better if there is oxygen, you know? Do you know this? If you're oxygen deprived, muscles become rigid because this needs air, otherwise it'll not work. So. Water is seventy-two percent. <laughs> so maximum care should be taken about the water because it's seventy-two percent. If you are going to an examination, suppose uh, it is like this, let's say you're going for physics examination. You have water, earth, this, that. But just the water subject is for seventy-two marks. Naturally you spend more time reading about water, isn't it? Studying water, yes or no? Air is only six percent. You may not study because you are okay with ninety-four. Water you must study because it's seventy-two percent. You must take enormous care about the water because it's seventy-two percent still substantial, isn't it? So how food goes into you, from whose hands it comes to you, how you eat it, how you approach it, all these things are important. Then comes your air, six percent. In that six percent, only one percent or less is your breath. Rest is happening in so many other ways. And it's important, especially if you have children, at least once a month, take them out somewhere, not to the damn cinema, again breathing everybody's nonsense. <laughs> the air gets affected just by the sounds and the intentions and the emotions, all the rubbish that's happening on the screen and all the rubbish that's reflecting in human minds, of violence, of sex, of greed, of this and that is affecting that limited air in that hall in a tremendous way. So instead of taking them to the cinema, take them to the river, teach them how to swim, climb a mountain, where is mountain Sadhguru? Himalayas is so far away. <laughs> Even a small hill is a mountain for your boy. Yes? Even a little rock? Just go climb and sit on one of them. 
Children will enjoy it immensely, they will become fit, you will become fit. And above all, your body and mind will function differently and above all, you are in touch with the Creator's creation which is the most important thing. Not your own rubbish that you made, yes it's comfortable right now, but it's not everything. So instead of going to the restaurant, instead of going to the cinema, instead of going somewhere else like that, at least once a month, it doesn't cost anything. Huh? Doesn't cost anything. You can take your rice and aukai and go and eat there. <laughs> anyway you have it, you don't have to spend money on this. Even better, if you don't want to spend money even on the bus or car, all of you cycle, just three kilometers, five kilometers outside Hyderabad, sit on one rock, just spend time there, feel the sun, it's very important you get some sun, air, good water, come back, you are doing Bhuta Shuddhi in a very natural way. It is not the ultimate type of Bhuta Shuddhi, but you are doing some Bhuta Shuddhi. This is what I was saying just now, if you take care of food, water, air is not always in your hands because you're living in a city. But water and food you can take care. And what kind of fire burns within you, that also you can take care. Sunlight has not become impure, isn't it? Get some sunlight every day, please. Get some sun on your body every day because sunlight is still pure, isn't it? Nobody can fortunately contaminate it. And what kind of fire burns within you? Is it the fire of greed, fire of hatred, fire of resentment, fire of anger, fire of love, fire of compassion? What kind of fire burns within you? You take care of that, then you don't worry about your physical and mental well-being, it's taken care of. One more thing if you want to do, you just light an organic oil lamp, a cotton wick, some oil, anything. What do you use here? Normal cooking oil, linseed oil, rice bran oil or sesame oil, what do you have? Olive oil. Olive oil, fine. Any organic oil with a cotton wick, just burn one little lamp somewhere in the room where you sleep you will see these things will completely disappear. If you can bring in a chant or there are nightly practices, yogic practices, before you go to bed, sit on your bed and do this practice. Do you know, in about… if you live for about sixty years, you're… on an average most human beings are eating anywhere between eleven hundred to fourteen hundred tons of food. So that means even what you think is my body is not this, it's changing every day. New input is happening and old things are going away. So fourteen hundred tons, you don't have to carry that much of weight right now. So obviously what you have as a body right now is just a transient amount of food and soil, isn't it? Hello? So what you think is mine also is not it, it is just all the time changing. Tonight before you go to bed, spend at least twelve, fifteen minutes reminding yourself, you're neither this body nor this mind. Just lie down and just remind yourself, this body is not really you. It is mine right now for use, but it's not really me. Just… if you're not able to do it, just link it to your breath. Inhalation, I'm not the body. Exhalation, I'm not even the mind. Just lie down for twelve minutes and do it till the last moment till you fall asleep. This is something you must notice. This is how the world is. If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. You will see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Yes. 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 But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any. I haven't found one yet. Yeah, all kinds of mixed bags, yes. but <laughs> if you are willing that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you're simply one big yes, you'll find a way. <laughs> Thank you so much. That… I… I, I always say that it's the resistance <laughs>
any problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere after 3 a.m. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, it will bear maximum fruit. In the way the planet is spinning and what is happening, something very fundamental changes somewhere between 320 to 340. This is called Brahma Mahurtam. This is relevant only up to 33 degrees latitude. Your system, human system, functions in a certain way. It is a possibility. So, uh, there has been an awareness about making use of this possibility. Your life is a product of many things that we call as the universe, many things that we call as existence. So, we are a consequence of a certain phenomenal happening that we call as cosmos. We are not an individual existence. So when you get in sync, certain things will happen. You know, there's a <coughs> cicadius in uh, where we are in Tennessee, the U.S. ashram, they wake up once in seventeen years. Can you beat it? They know it is seventeen years and they come awake and they breathe and they go back to sleep. They're keeping time once in seventeen years. No alarm bell anywhere. Well, how is this? I'm saying they are in sync with nature. We have lost sync within nature and we think that is our nature. No. All the many ailments, many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces which are making us who we are. So yoga is to bring that sink so that you are in rhythm with life. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere just after 3 a.m. If you're conscious, suddenly a certain spark of aliveness will happen within you. Even if you're in deep sleep, you will come awake. This must happen to you. This means you're falling in sync with it. You're falling in sync with life. So what should I do? Should I meditate? Should I do a Kriya? Doesn't matter what, you must do a process for which you have been initiated for. Because initiation means… Just do this one simple exercise. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy. Generally, in India they told you, you should not put your head to the north and sleep. Hmm? You're aware of this? If you put your head to the north and sleep during the night when you… when you're in horizontal positions, then slowly the blood will get pulled towards your brain. When there is too much circulation in the brain, you cannot sleep peacefully. If you have any kind of, you know, inherently weak aspects in your brain or if you are of old age, you could die in your sleep. One can have hemorrhage because extra blood is trying to enter the brain, where the blood vessels are hair-like. Something extra is being pushed because of the magnetic pull. When you're in a vertical position, this is not so. The moment you become horizontal, this pull on the head is so strong that slowly the blood tries to move towards the brain. So to avoid this, this is true only in the Northern Hemisphere. If you go to Australia, you should not put your head to the south. If you're in India, 
you should not put your head to the north. You can put it any other way, it's okay. You can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. This is getting too easy, just sleeping sadhana. So coming awake to an alarm bell with a sudden start is not the best way to do your life. How many of you find uh, that one day morning when you get up without any reason, you're just feeling ugly for no reason? If it is happening even at least two, three times a year, if it is, then you must do certain things before you go to bed. It's very, very important because unconsciously, you need to understand this, you can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. Either pleasantness or unpleasantness, you can incubate very effectively uninterrupted in sleep. You can also incubate it in the day, but there are so many interruptions, it doesn't happen very efficiently. But if you have a tendency to go to bed in a certain way and you wake up in the morning really nasty for simply no reason, that means you are incubating things in the night very efficiently. Bad eggs. This is not just about psychological disturbances, it can cause major physiological problems over a period of time. It's, it's important that you eliminate these things from your life. So, before you go to bed in the night, there are certain things that you need to take care of. It's best if you're eating meat and other kinds of meals you eat at least three to four hours before you go to bed. The digestion is over. Before going to bed, drink a certain amount of water and go to bed. You will see it gets taken care of just like this. One simple thing can be just a shower. Always to shower before you go to bed, it'll make a lot of difference. In this weather, Maybe cold showers are difficult, so you go for lukewarm showers, don't go for hot showers in the night. Go for lukewarm showers, it makes you alert. So you will think, oh, I cannot sleep. It doesn't matter, you will sleep fifteen, twenty minutes or half an hour later, but you will sleep better because it will take away certain things. When you shower, it is not just the dirt on the skin that you're taking away. Have you noticed if you're very tense and anxious, whatever, just a shower, you came out and feels like almost the burden has been taken away from you? Have you not noticed this? So it's not just about washing the skin. A whole lot of things happen when water flows over your body. This shower is a very rudimentary bhuti shuddhi because over seventy percent of your body is actually water. If you run water over it, a certain purification happens which is beyond cleaning the skin. Keep this in your mind that you are truly a mortal, okay? Not in words, really, you could fall dead right now. Uh, you may be young, you may be old, it doesn't matter, you can fall dead right now. Yes or no? Before you go to bed, sit on your bed and think this is your deathbed. You have just one more minute to live. Just look back and see, what you have done today, is it worthwhile? Just do this one simple exercise and you don't know when it really happens, whether you'll be sitting on your deathbed or lying in a hospital, all kinds of things sticking into you, who knows how it'll happen. But enjoy this every day that you'll sit on your deathbed, look back and see today, the way I've handled these twenty-four hours, is it worthwhile? Because now I'm dying. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. So every day in the night, all of you should do this before you go to bed. Last three minutes, everything that you have gathered, the body, the content of the mind, things, don't ignore small things, the small things are big things. I've seen how people are carrying their… their own private pillow, you know? 
because it's very important. <laughs> so, your pillow, your footwear, if you have relationships, everything that you have gathered, keep it aside, sleep. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy, with much more possibilities than you have imagined possible. Just sleep as life, not as a man, not as a woman, not as this and that. Keep everything down, simply. See, I'm, this is getting too easy. Just sleeping sadhana, hmm? At least this you must do. Focus in our daily life. So, what's your definition of focus? Okay. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference. There is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, Attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist. All that's happened is there is no attention because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. 